Councillors, guests and members of the public, good evening and welcome to St James's School. Some housekeeping before we begin. We're not expecting the fire alarm to sound this evening, but if it does, please leave the building through the fire exits and meet outside at the fire assembly point. Councillors will be using tablet devices to access the agenda for the meeting. We always welcome people to speak at the meeting, although this is a formal committee meeting of Eastleigh Borough Council, not a public meeting. The members of the public that have registered to speak will be invited to uh, speak at the, uh, at the relevant agenda item and will be given a total of three minutes to speak. Uh, one of the speakers has come to me just now and asked if they could have that extended and I've agreed to extend it by a minute to four minutes, so if you would adhere to that please. Um, when the light is amber, you'll have 30 seconds remaining. People wishing to speak on an item on the agenda are able to do so before the debate starts. Once the debate has started, however, it is not possible to invite or receive comments from the floor. We want to be as inclusive as possible, but will not tolerate any disruptions to our meeting. Should there be any disruption, we do have the power under the Council's constitution to remove people from the meeting or, or continue in private, neither of which we take lightly or wish to do. Councillors are reminded that to take part in this meeting, you, have an, you must have an open mind so that you can take... <laughs> Councillors are reminded that to take part in this meeting, you must have an open mind so that you can take all relevant considerations presented to the meeting into account in reaching your decision. By attending today, you have decided that you will listen to all points of view expressed by the speakers and public and are able to participate and cannot be seen to have predetermined the application. This meeting will be video recorded and will be uploaded to the Council's website. If any members of the public prefer not to be recorded, then please do contact a member of the staff. If you're planning on filming or recording the meeting, then do please let us know so that we can ensure you're not filming members of the public that do not wish to be filmed. The Chair reserves the right to ask any, fil right to ask any filming considered intrusive to be stopped. More information is available on the Council's website. So, apologies. Do we have any apologies, Laura? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillor Goma. Thank you. Are there any other apologies for absence? Declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest they wish to make? Councillor Marsh. Councillor Marsh. Um, for transparency, I wish to declare that I own a property near to the application site. However, having taken advice, I consider this as, a non as not a disclosable pecuniary interest. And so, therefore, in this application, I am able to take part in the discussion and the decision. We now move to the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of November 2021. Can I approve these as a true record? Do, do I have a proposer? Janice. A seconder? Steve. All agreed? I think that's... Yeah. Thank you, councillors. So, public participation that it will be no public participation on this occasion. Planning guidelines. Dawn, can uh, you present the guidelines, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, this is the normal planning guidelines which we present to give guidance on considering and determining planning applications. So there's just one planning application on the agenda tonight. So proposals 
must be considered on relevant planning grounds and only the application plans and details um, shall be considered. Now, if, if you've got ideas that something different could be proposed, then that isn't what is in front of you for consideration. Um, all applications must be considered uh, in line with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. And as I'm sure members are aware, we now have the adopted Eastleigh Borough Council local plan, which is part of the development plan. And also the Hampshire Minerals and Waste plan is also constitutes another element to the adopted development plan. So other material considerations which may uh, come into play are referenced in your committee report. So that may be other planning commissions uh, for the site, um, uh, environmental impact and habitat regulations considerations which are relevant to tonight's agenda item, other su supplementary planning documents, consultation responses, particularly from the statutory consultees and site specific matters. Um, where there are relevant appeal decisions and case law, they would be referenced as well. So the National um, Planning Policy Framework 2021 is of key material consideration and it has uh, those key objectives that are listed on the screen. Um, I've added the uh, advice in respect of flood risk because that is relevant to this application on the agenda tonight. Um, so um, it gives guidance about uh, flood risk and seeks avoiding that wherever possible. Um, in terms of um, decision making, then uh, the issues can be weighed up in what we call the planning balance, which are at the end is detailed in the report. At the end of the report, the committee can delegate a decision to the executive head of housing and economy and that may include matters such as final conditions. Procedurally, um, because if there, if there are applications that are subject to environmental impact assessment, there are various procedures that have to be followed, including referral to the Secretary of State, and, um, and that is again referenced in the report, and is the application on the agenda tonight is EIA development. Um, also, just to note that whilst this is a planning application and adheres to planning guidance and legislation, the statutory consultees um, may have other consenting regimes which are separate to planning but also in parallel to it. So, again, that could be the Environment Agency, Hampshire Highways, Hampshire Flood and Water Team, um, Public Rights of Way Diversion Orders. Again, we've got an item on the agenda tonight for that. So there are other decision making processes separate to planning, which you will be aware of. Um, so that's a sort of brief summary of the relevant planning guidelines for tonight's application, um, so uh, uh, which are also detailed in your committee report. Thank you. Sorry. So we, we now move on to agenda item six, the planning application itself. Uh, so I will ask Dawn again as the principal planner to present the report. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, this, is, this application is a detailed planning application for the construction of the road between Allington Lane and Burnett's Lane. Um, so as I've said, it's um, also subject to environmental impact assessment. So that's in the description. So just a brief introduction um, following the postponement of the committee um, and the consideration of this report in April. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm having to <laughs> do old school today. Um, the, uh, so following from the postponement in April of uh, the committee considering this con uh, uh, committee item, this was to give more time for some uh, technical issues to be considered by the various consultees um, and so we've had those extra few months to, to do that. Um, so that was for Hampshire County Councillors of Flood and Water Authority to consider surface water runoff 
technical information, so that's been provided and considered. Hampshire County Council is High Roads Authority to conclude on some adoption queries. Again, that's, that's complete. Hampshire County Council, as the countryside team wanted more detailed information, particularly around the diversion routes, that's completed. Um, the Environment Agency, a critical consultee, wanted um, more information and updated hydro hydrological modelling on the Quabbly stream flood risk, and that's been completed and concluded. Um, Natural England wanted to see the Council's appropriate assessment under the habitat regulations. Uh, again, that's been completed, and um, they've had further information on, on top of that. And also, we wanted to undertake further neighbour consultation once we'd received additional drainage information in particular, which again was undertaken during August. Um, so that, you know, there's been a fair amount of um, t work <laughs> in the last few months um, addressing all those technical and detailed considerations. But in summary, the bridge design for this application, which was one of the main issues, um, hasn't changed in detail, so the plans you'll see aren't significantly different. It's the background modelling information that has been updated, particularly in respect to flood risk. And also, just to explain, this is a standalone planning application for a road, um, but it is very much part of the bigger Horton Heath, one Horton Heath scheme. Um, it's key supporting infrastructure, and the reason why it's come forward as opposed to waiting f to submit under a reserve matters uh, application once the outline permission has been granted is so that the infrastructure can be delivered early. Um, there's lots of lead-in requirements which need to be sort of get underway and, and so, you know, the, separating the road out from all the detail of the outline um, is, is, is important to enable that to be dealt with more quickly. Obviously, it hasn't been that quick. We've had the application for over a year, but it still does enable um, that consideration of, of, of infrastructure first. So that's just a sort of introduction, really. Then just moving into, can, sorry, can we move down? Yeah. So um, again, more background, really. So just a reminder, because it's a little while ago since members looked at the outline um, application. It was last um, last year, last September, nearly a year ago. Um, so a reminder that the road has always been part of the concept master plan, always part of planning policy for the site, policy HH1 in particular, but also the strategic policy S11 for road infrastructure in the now adopted local plan. Um, so it is, um, it is shown um, on supporting the supporting master plan. Sorry, you have to bear with me while I find, hopefully you can see the pointer, but the road is shown on that master plan in the location. Um, uh, shown in the planning application that you're considering tonight. And then obviously there's just some further detail just to remind you what the rest of the scheme is. So including two and a half thousand houses and other infrastructure. So that um, indicates both the policy and the concept master plan which has been considered and supported by committee is that the road is acceptable in principle that that has been accepted. Um, also, the access parameter plan. Sorry. Um, right. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's worth knowing. So, the access um, parameter plan, which also was in support of the outline application, includes the road in that in that location, amongst other other details for um, access for. Um, vehicular and pedestrian and cyclist movements. Uh, yes, and then um, again, background really, but um, just a reminder really that other consents overlap with the, the application being considered. So uh, the first residential parcel, which is a detailed application for 381 dwellings, was considered by the committee uh, last um, uh, last October last year, sorry, in November last year, um, and that um, the stretch of the the road in that in that application 
So this is at the bottom of the site. So this is the Burnett's Lane roundabout. Then you have the road running through up to about where the Chalkoff Farm is track. That is identical to the road, that the stretch of the road in the application being considered tonight. So it has already been considered, but we've got a duplicating application for tonight. And they have to be, the plans have to, clearly have to be identical um, to, to be able to implement both planning permissions. So that's, uh, so that's, um, that, that has been looked at and supported by committee um, and equally um, the committee approved a planning application to relocate solar panels um, within the site so on the the, the uh t t on the the plans uh, here you can see a and b so the relocation of solar plans from a to b uh, was necessary for approval to um, to enable the road to be positioned as proposed. So that's, um, that's a bit of background. And then moving on to the particular site constraints for this application for the road, um, then the, the, the plan on the left shows you the public rights of way. So there are three public rights of way which cross the site roughly east to west. Um, there are three watercourses also crossing the site east to west, uh, or largely. Um, so there are those considerations. Um, so the watercourses are shown in blue on the right-hand plan. Um, we've got three streams, Quobley, Foxwood and Tol Tolbrook. Quobley is a main river, um, so considered by the Environment Agency. They all drain to the, towards um, the more green stream in the River Itchin. And then we also have woodland on the site, uh, or adjacent to the site, which some of it is protected as a uh, sink. Um, and um, there's, there's other woodland that is within, uh, within the site north of the solar farm. So there are just some of the considerations, the constraints that have been part of the, uh, of the application. Right, so moving on to the application details then, as I've said, it's a standalone application. Uh, it, is, um, it is a complex application and as part of a much you know, bigger scheme, which is also has a lot of strands to it, which means that it is environmental impact assessments, um, an application that has to be considered with an environmental statement and considered under the EIA regulations as well as the habitat regulations, that's HRA matters. So there are, um, there, there's a, there, there's a, there are whole levels of legislation that have to be considered and are all detailed in the report um, as you know, information as well as procedural matters um, relating to those, that legislation. I'll come on to that in a bit. Um, the application itself, that the red line is, indicates the application site. So literally uh, the road and its immediate surroundings it's uh, just over a mile long, um, 1.8 kilometres, uh, six and a half metre wide road, which is suitable for HGVs and buses. Uh, it has footways and cycleways along its entire route. Um, also, um, it, the site includes, uh, it crosses Fir Tree Lane. Point to point, 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 point. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's not really going to work, I don't think. Right, sorry. Um, so, Fir Tree Lane, um, I'm, I'm sure members are familiar with it, crosses the site west to east and the mid part of the site. That will um, be closed ultimately um, when the, w w even when the link road gets opened um, and the, during the construction period that will have a temporary turning head for, for vehicles. But ultimately it will be downgraded to effectively bridleway status with some individual rights of access. Um, so that, again, was part of the outline consideration. But just to note that uh, in terms of the scheme here. So the plan in front of you um, now is for the entire route of the scheme. So being over a mile long, it's obviously, <laughs> I can't show you all the detail in one document, one plan, but that is the entire route. Um, 
there are the green is is a woodland and um, trees that are uh, uh, you know near the the root of the road. The mid part of the site is the solar farm. You can see greyed out, um, which uh, which largely remains just small adjustments to it, as I've pointed out. So yeah, running obviously between the the roundabouts that have already been constructed, um, at Allington Lane to the north and Burnett's Lane to the south. So just to sort of break that down a little bit for you, because it is a difficult to show it on one one plan. The northern section, Allington Lane to Fir Tree Lane, is is shown on the screen. Um, it includes the Quadleaf Stream, which uh, is marked on the plan. So uh, the road crosses uh, the stream, uh, and that is, as I've said, is is classified as a main river and has been subject to extensive flood risk assessment, including an exception test, whereby um, you consider um, whether to allow the supports for the bridges to sit in flood zone or not. Um, it is allowed, providing there's compensation for flood risk, uh, which has been what the consideration has been. So that uh, has been, uh, you know, a very critical part of the assessment of the application. The bridges over the Quadley, Quadley Stream are separated, so we've got a separate uh, ve uh, vehicle crossing, uh, separate to the separate bridge for pedestrian and cyclists, and that's that's to 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 control the impact, to minimise the impact, but also it, 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 in design terms, it's a good option. Uh, public, the public right of way, footpath 11, is shown on the plan. Uh, that has a minor diversion needed to go around the drainage pond, which you can see. Um, so that is shown on this drawing. Um, those drainage ponds are also important. They're designed to accommodate additional runoff as well. So another, another form of managing flood risk and drainage, they, they can hold extra water if needed. Um, so the uh, I've mentioned the fair tree lane will be stopped up and downgraded as well. That's shown on the plan too. Um, in terms of the footway cycleway and this stretch of the road, it is just on the eastern side of the road because there isn't any residential uh, development on the western side. So where it's not needed um, on both sides of the road, it, it hasn't been proposed. But that changes as the as the route heads south. So that's the Ellington Lane to Fir Tree Lane stretch. Um, I'm just going to show you um, the elevations of the bridges. So they're the Quadley Stream bridges, which now have the support from the technical consultees, including the EA and Hampshire Highways. So the top drawing is for the um, is for the road for the vehicular vehicle, car bridge, the, the vehicle motorised vehicle bridge, the brick the brick uh, construction, and then the the lower drawing is for the is a timber construction for the um, pedestrian and cyclists uh, and a separate separate path. Th those bridges have um, been very thoroughly assessed, so they um, they've been assessed for flood risk to make sure that they they don't um, adversely affect flood risk. They've also been checked for safety by the highway authority and they've been checked by the Environment Agency and others for to make sure that they've got um, appropriate mammal ledges so that, um, so that, they, that, that um, otters in particular can, can travel under the bridge um, safely. So there's been various aspects to the consideration of the design of those bridges. Um, OK, so then um, moving uh, on to just briefly talk about hydrological modelling. I'm not a drainage engineer. We do have one here if we've got very technical questions. But this has been a large part of the extra work that's been done since April. So the hydrological modelling has been um, re reviewed, updated uh, with full guidance from the Environment Agency, who have then assessed it and have now supported it. Um, so this is one extract from it, which shows a marginal flood risk betterment. Um, so the green area to the left of the 
the road uh, uh, bridge where it crosses uh, Quabbley um, shows a marginal increase in capacity for for, for flood risk water management um, and then to the right of, to the east of the road there are the blue areas are new areas of of flood flood risk are given over to flood flood risk flood flooding areas if if needed um, yeah, I'm not a drainage engineer. I, I, I would have to uh, ask a drainage engineer to explain it further than that. But that's sort of the summary, really, is that there's a marginal betterment in terms of flood risk. Um, obviously, where we need to get to is that there's no further risk to flood flooding. So that that is where the hydrological mod modelling has has got to, and is supported by the Environment Agency. It includes the one in a hundred year flood event and additional um, uh, capacity for climate change. In terms of other flood risk management, then um, the general principle is that existing greenfield rates from fields particularly um, must, must be maintained. So even though there's development, there shouldn't be any extra flood risk from surface water drainage. And again, that's been part of the consideration. Sorry. So moving on then, sort of moving down, southwards down the road, this is the sort of next stretch which runs west of the solar farm between the two streams which aren't main rivers. So there's Foxwood Stream which is within the Green Woodland area just north of Footpath 701. So they're, they're very close together at that point and there's again um, separate bridges crossing the Foxwood Stream at that point. Then moving south, um, a further bridge crossing Tolbrook Stream, and that's a combined bridge. So both the vehicular traffic and pedestrian cyclists are all within one bridge at that point. Um, you can see uh, on the, what well, I'll show you the details later, but there, there are new trees proposed along the whole route of the road, but particularly next to the solar farm, there's more landscaping proposed to sort of act as a buffer for the solar park and, and, and have an attractive landscaped environment for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, again, this stretch, the footway cycleways on the eastern side um, of the road, uh, there are other sustainable drainage provisions um, proposed, uh, you know, a fair amount of balancing ponds um, needed to accommodate the highway drainage. Um, and as I've said, that, that there are um, separate bridges for the Foxwood stream and combined bridges for the Tolbrook stream. So just to, again, to show you some elevations of those, um, very similar. So the brick, the brick bit bridges are for the uh, vehicles and then the timber bridges for the timber bridge for the pedestrian cyclists and the Tolbrook stream is a combined bridge. And then just the last part of this route. So this is the Chowcroft Farm stretch running down to Burnett's Lane. So this is the bit that needs to be identical to the first residential parcel application. And indeed it is. So um, that ha this actually has already been considered by the committee previously and under that separate application, um, which has the residential parcel to the east of the road. It includes a right turn lane uh, designed to, to, uh, which we know the detail of um, for, to, for the road leading up to the local centre to the east. There are footways and cycleways on both sides of, of the road at this point with um, details of design, uh, crossings provided. And again, um, avenue trees are, are proposed on both sides of the road. gone too far right okay thank you um this is just a we've got a number of landscape plans obviously for the whole stretch of the road so this is just an example of a landscaping plan which is for the the, the stretch around the charcoal farm track as i've said with trees lining the road grass verges and, and swales which is sort of help 
manage with water management. There are there is a need for some embankments, and not they're not high. They're certainly not one two metres high at any point along the stretch of the road. But you know the the site isn't entirely flat, so that we'll need a bit of cut and fill. Um, and yeah, not just trees. We've got hedges and shrubs around this, particularly around the drainage ponds proposed, and the ponds themselves are designed to be wetlands, so they will they won't be sterile highway drainage ponds, which we do see sometimes there will be ponds with planting in them which help with other um, eco ecology matters uh, for the whole site. Right, okay, good. Right, so that's, that's the plans. Um, uh, so just that there are a few report updates, not, not many. Um, in paragraph 54, we've just had a further we've had some correspondence with Natural England around their consultation response because they've somewhat sat on the fence in terms of they haven't objected or not objected. Their formal position remains that they, fer they require further information, which is information that is required at condition discharge stage. So, um, and we've discussed the wording of conditions with them and I've got an update to give you. Um, but they particularly want to see the construction environment management plan, so that's during the construction process, to see particularly sediments are appropriately managed. And then, um, again, the main concern is around sediments for the lo ongoing long-term management of the drainage, uh, drainage ponds in particular, so which is a condition matter. So, um, th so that's where we've got to, and we've concluded our discussions with Natural England for, for this stage of the, of the build, and we will talk to them if they want to, um, again, about condition discharge. Um, we've, in response to their comments, we've, had, we've undertaken a minor update to our appropriate assessment um, to just reference the, the, the conditions that we've been discussing. So that's all complete in terms of the appropriate assessment process and fully responded to Natural England. Um, in terms of other report updates, I've, we have circulated earlier today some, again, minor updates to conditions. Um, condition six, the, land, the, um, the landscape and ecology management plan. This is again in response to Natural England and in the Environment Agency's comments that they want the final version of that to be um, uh, to, to be approved prior to commencement of development. We do actually have just received that today, but it's a bit late <laughs> for this committee to, to know whether it's acceptable or not. So um, the condition is recommended to be amended to a prior commencement of development condition um, in line with those consultees' advice. So that's an update to the report, which did recommend within three months of commencement of development. It's just a management plan, but given the quantity of advice, we've, we've brought that timing slightly earlier. Um, and then, um, yes, yeah, so, sorry, just to some typo, uh, so uh, an amendment to condition nine, so we've added a not, um, just about see it in bold, just above the reason, which is crossed out with it twice, so we've missed a not out in that wording. Apologies for that, but that's now correctly worded. And then finally, just that we realised that condition 10 on acoustics didn't have a reason. We have to give reasons for our conditions in our decision notices, so that's now added. That's all the update to conditions as of now. Um, so then just moving on to the key considerations. Obviously, it's a very detailed report. There are lots of matters that are covered in much detail in the report, as is required under the various strands of legislation that we're, we're dealing with, um, including EIA and Habitat Regs matters. Um, but as I've said, the development principle is clearly acceptable in the now, with now the adopted local plan and also um, the previous considerations that we've had in support for the outline plans. Um, water management and flooding has been a key issue for consideration. Um, we are now at the point where we can firmly say that the principle of crossing watercourses is accepted by all consultees. The bridge day details have been very thoroughly checked, as has the flood risk information, which has been updated at the request of 
consultees. And critically, we have no objection from the Environment Agency and Hampshire County Council as the lead flood authority, subject to conditions which are extensive, um, quite robust. We've made sure that that is the case and enforceable. So we've had discussions with the consultees on the precise wording of those conditions, which is all agreed and are in your report subject to the minor amendments I've just um, tabled. Um, I have to say the consultees have been very thorough um, and they are aware of previous flooding in the area so they um, that, you know that they are, they, their thoroughness has um, has uh, has been I think a reflection of that as well so um, we're very confident that the advice that they're giving is is indeed the correct advice um, other matters um, obviously traffic and highways this is a this is infrastructure, it's a road, it doesn't in itself generate traffic, that's the other uses, the residential and the commercial uses which generate the traffic, but it carries traffic. Um, so obviously that has been considered um, alongside what was considered with the outline uses which are the traffic generators. Um, let's just see, you know, we've missed a slide. <laughs> All right, let's try again. Yeah, okay. Um, so I've mentioned the new footways and cycleways. They're, you know, they're again very comprehensive um, and the road is designed for a bus route and um, so that, that, that may be the route in the future or, or at least part of the road will accommodate the, bus, the buses. Um, in terms of footpath diversions, then we've mentioned that there are three footpaths that are affected. There is a separate report on the diversion uh, order application on the agenda. Um, they are quite minimal. Um, they are necessary to, say, go around the drainage ponds and just make crossings more um, direct. So rather than crossing the road at an angle, you do it at right angles. So that's, you know, that's a safe way of doing it. So it's... Um, an overall improvement and those um, those footpaths are part of an overall improvement to the footpath network which is part of the one Horton Heath scheme which includes upgrades to existing paths. Ecology is a, you know very also a very key consideration there are a number of strands to ecology which are covered in the report including um, biodiversity net gain which is a new matter which you'll hear more about with new with further applications coming to the agenda sustainable drainage um, protected species are also covered there are there are protected species um, including great crested newts which need um, translocation um, and the sites the adjoining woodland and the site of importance for nature conservation is safeguarded so as well as protecting uh, ecology then there's also um, provision for new ecology new habitats new planting um, so that is a positive um, scheme in that respect um, ecology is also part is is very much the appropriate assessment consideration under habitat regulations so the habitat regulations are in respect of the international internationally designated protected ecology sites, so that's the Solent, the New Forest um, in some instances, um, and the River Itchen. So it's those habitats that we are considering under appropriate assessment and, and take natural and advice, which we've done, as well as our own ecologist advice, and all that process has been concluded. Environmental impact considerations are wider, so they, they include ecology, but they include any other environmental impacts that have been scoped in and that's going covered in the report so that might include traffic um, impacts um, uh, health impacts for example climate change so um, they're, they're wider and the process is different but we we have those both both those processes to to follow and consider so yeah so that this next slide is just just advising on that under EIA process, we notify the Secretary of State. We've done it twice already. Um, when the uh, during the course of the application, that gives the Secretary of State the opportunity to call in an application for 
public inquiry for independent assessment if they so wish. They haven't done so um, to date, and we also, if planning permission is granted, we also give a further notification at that stage. That's a legal requirement. Um, we have to give reasons for granting commission, again, uh, under EIA regs, so that is covered in the report. At the end of the report, there's a, there's a summary there for reasons under EIA processes. Um, and then the separate appropriate assessment under the habitat regulations um, are, have been completed. I've said Eastley Borough Council are the competent authority and we take natural England's advice. Um, so our ecologist has undertaken that appropriate assessment and uh, that is now concluded. It's there, sorry, I'm looking at my screen, <laughs> not that one. So just to, yeah, just the conclusion is, um, and it's in the report, it is a, you know, it's a, it's a road, but it has a number of elements to it, and it does um, have a positive planning balance and wider, uh, supports wider community benefits and infrastructure for the Horton Heath scheme. The recommendation is as per the report, it's not updated, so it is to grant permission subject to those the publishing of the environmental impact assessment procedural matters, um, notifying the Secretary of State, um, the completion of final conditions, which are just the updates that I've given you. So I don't think, uh, unless members have got additional conditions, um, that's my recommendation at the moment, that the conditions are as per recommendation tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, that concludes my uh, recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dawn. So I understand we have uh, some speakers and some statements uh, to be read out this evening. So can I invite Jan Coombs to, to come up and speak, please? As I said, you, you have an extra minute, so you have four minutes instead of uh, three. Let me stop you, me gabbling and you not understanding me in time, but thank you. I think it's a bit... Can we, uh, can we move the microphone down a bit, please? I just... Is that better? I think that's right. Can you hear me? Good evening. On behalf of myself and residents of the Granary in Allington Lane, we object to the latest planning application for construction of road between Allington Lane and Burnett's Lane based on the outcome of the construction of the roundabout and roadworks undertaken in Allington Lane over 18 months ago. This led to extensive flooding which damaged a number of properties. Sadly, EBC have made no apparent efforts to remedy any of the faults identified through an independent report, and the HCC Highways Authority has still not accepted responsibility for the new section of road and roundabout after all this time since construction finished. This has left local residents in perpetual fear of flooding when it rains or is forecast, having to deal emotionally and financially with the after effects of this flood. Based on this, we have no confidence in EBC addressing any of the planning conditions recommended by the EA on the 31st of August 22, if they are applied post-approval of this application. Whilst we welcome the lead local flood authority edition of, of the verification handover survey and report on completion of the construction of the road to ensure that all planning conditions are fulfilled, we, in the meantime, as residents, will have to contend with a fear of flooding being <coughs> aggravated by these works without any reinsurance from EBC that planning conditions will be met and remedial works carried out on the issues that have already caused us in the area to flood. We recommend that all conditions, including Condition 7, are met before planning approval is given. Uh, and that EBC remedy the issues that have caused the works already completed on the roundabout and new road. The condition of surface water drainage uh, says from the EA, no development shall take place until a water management plan, including details on how water surface management drainage from the road will be managed, is submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. I would like to ask the following questions. Firstly, what assurances have we got that the local residents won't be left with an increased risk of flooding at the intersection of Fir Tree Lane and Arlington Lane, when the initial work that's already been completed has caused actual flooding? Has EBC taken into account in their calculations on flood risks for the existing road extension? 
What assurances have local residents got that EBC will maintain these new works before they are handed over to the Highways Authority with a certificate of completion when they have not undertaken any evident maintenance evident maintenance or repair to the drainage system, including the balanced pond and culverts, other than grass cutting the verges on the new Arlington Lane. Why has the previous works on Arlington Lane still not been handed over to highways after nearly two years? Therefore, they have not received a certificate of completion to confirm that they have met all planning conditions. How can the local residents be assured the same poor process won't happen again in this application? We are pleased that you have added and changed many parts of your original plans since the last meeting on the advice of EA and HCC, and we are acutely aware that time is essential for you to complete this road. You must not cut corners, however, in the design and the construction, regardless of cost, and you must follow the recommendations from all the agencies who have red flagged the many failings still in this application. We don't want promises, we want action. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I just finished. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I am. Do you want me to explain briefly? Um, I'm here on behalf of my father, who's 85 and has been taken poorly. I'll probably have to take him to hospital later this evening. Um, and his wife, my stepmother, they were both going to have their three minutes each. I'm hoping you'll allow me to have three minutes for Dad and then three minutes for Paula. Um, he had a lot more to say, so I've edited it down. Um, my dad would absolutely agree with what Jan has just said. He lives very close to her. Um, Jan's done the work in terms of all the legalities. What dad has to say is very much from the heart. He's 85 years old. He's lived where he lives for 60 plus years. Um, and uh, this is keeping him awake at night. He genuinely is really concerned because he knows stuff that you guys don't know about all this. Um, so he says, you councillors here today have a chance to start putting right some of the mistakes of the past. Southampton is a city almost surrounded by water and climate change means ever rising tides water is like the wind you cannot stop it I can tell you all about tides and how 70 years ago actually rained more than it does these days but causing much less flooding and less damage obviously because there were a lot fewer roads and so on Please listen to our new king and to the people of wisdom like David Attenborough who have been warning us for decades about devastation due to climate change and overdevelopment. Don't ignore them any longer. Tarmac and concrete and man-made pollution are heating up our planet. This area we are talking about has long been called Horton Bog by locals. It is a beautiful low-lying area full of wildlife. Its underbody is clay. Its top surface is like a sponge and even a little rain soon fills that sponge. There has already been far too much development in this area. Please Please, you need to change. No more development in the Itchen Valley this side of Winchester. Vote with your heart and vote no to building on Horton Bog. The Itchen stream still flash floods two or three times a year. I fear a tragedy where some young family may get trapped in deep water in their car. Uh, two large environment agency vans got stuck in deep floods uh, in Allington Lane last summer, and luckily they were big vans because even those men were concerned for their safety. Two young men have already died along uh, Allington Lane um, in the last 40 years because local councils filled in the ditches in Fir Tree Lane, causing spring water to freeze on the bend of Allington Lane. If you don't believe me, ask the police. I was there. I held him while he died. I was 15 years old. Um, I invite you all to visit me at Moon River. This is my father, John Butt, inviting you all. I would be very pleased to show you the problems any time. Please come and see for yourselves the terrible situation, which will be made ten times worse if this big development goes ahead. This is for our safety, our environment, our wildlife, our children and grandchildren. Please, no more roads, houses, tarmac and concrete. Leave this beautiful countryside alone. So that's what my father had to say. And then my stepmother, Paula Butt, who also lives at Moon River. Building more concrete roads and houses is wrong, and you are taking part in destroying local habitats and, in a wider sense, the planet. Um, David Attenborough would be saying so. You are contributing to flooding my home, Moon River, along Allington Lane, and the surrounding area. You are destroying the wildlife. Two types of deer live and breed here. There are two badger sets and several families of foxes. Also stoats, weasels, and rare harvest mice who build their beautiful little homes in the reeds. We also have short-tailed and common field mice, and it is one of the few local spots where moles thrive. 
alive. Barn owls live in our roof at Moon River and we have tawny owls and little owls along with a wonderful collection of songbirds including the now rare nuthatch, tree creeper, golden crested wren, long tail tits, marsh tits and others plus all the British snakes, newts and lizards and their habitat is being destroyed. Horton Bog is quite unique. Originally, it was arable land ploughed by horses. When free milk was provided for school children, all six of the little local farms became dairy farms. One of those farms, Foxhole Farm, which has now been demolished, was uh, farmed by the Marsh family for many years. They weren't called the Marsh family for no reason. The land proved to be too wet for all of that. Yes, too wet. So most of that land has been used for simply grazing horses or hayfields or left to nature more or less ever since. The majority of the land you propose to build on has only ever been ploughed by horses, hence its uniqueness. It is a place of beauty and should be left alone. Please, please stop. Thank you. This is a written statement on behalf of Kia Wingrove. Uh, we object to the latest planning application for the construction of the road between Allington Lane and Burnett's Lane based upon the outcome of the construction of the roundabouts and the roadworks undertake, undertaken on Allington Lane over 18 months ago. This led to extensive flooding which damaged a number of properties. Eastleyborough Council have made no efforts to remedy any of the faults identified though, through an independent report and the HEC Highways Authority still has not accepted responsibility for the new section of road and roundabouts over 18 months after construction finished. This has left local residents in perpetual fear of flooding and having to deal emotionally and financially with the after effect of the flooding. Based on this, we have no confidence in Eastborough Council addressing any of the special conditions requested by the Environment Agency on the 31st of August 2022 if they are applied post approval of the application. Whilst we rec welcome the Environment Agency's addition of the handover survey by the local lead flood agency on completion of the construction to ensure all residents, to ensure all the Environment Agency's conditions are fulfilled. In the meantime, we the residents will have to contend with a fear of further flooding being exacerbated by these works without any reassurance from East Liberal Council that planning conditions will be met and remedial works carried out on the issues they have already caused on Allington Lane. We recommend all conditions, including condition seven be below, are met before planning approval is given and that East Liberal Council remedy the issues they have already caused in Allington Lane by the new works on the roundabout. Condition 7, service water drainage. No development shall take place until a water management plan, including details on how service water management drainage from the road will be managed, is submitted to, to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Questions for the planning meeting. One, what assurance have we got that local residents won't be left with an increased risk of flooding at the intersection of Fir Tree Lane and Allington Lane when the initial work completed for the new development, East Liberal Council and Allington Lane has caused actual flooding as identified by an independent report? Number two, what assurance have local residents got that EBC have taken into the increase taken into the increased risk of flooding on Allington Lane caused by the new roundabout works in their calculations on the flood risk for the, this road extension. Number three, what assurance have local residents got that EBC will maintain these new works before handing over to HCC Highways Authority with a certificate of completion when we have seen this is not to have occurred on the previous works on Allington Lane? Question four, when the previous works on Allington Lane have still not been handed over to the Highways Authority nearly two years after coming to use by the general motoring public and therefore haven't been issued a certificate of completion to confirm that they have met all planning conditions, how can the local residents be assured that the same won't happen for this planning application? That was uh, on behalf of Kia Wingrove. Thank you very much, Andy. 
So now we have uh, a couple of uh, statements to be read out on behalf of the supporters. So it's David Cranmer. Can I ask David to come up to the uh, microphone, please? Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's nice to be back for the committee again tonight on a, a significant milestone for the Warren Hall and Heath project and a, an important step towards unlocking the, the potential of the borough and sustainably meeting its housing need. So whilst this committee will recall resolving to support the principal road when we met last year to consider the outline plan application, and the road is included in the Council's local plan, this detailed application is before you tonight to enable the road to be delivered as early as possible in accordance with the Council's commitment to an infrastructure first approach and in recognition of its strategic importance to the local highway network. The application therefore sets out the detail of the road and the approach taken to ensure that this isn't simply an engineering exercise, but the road takes the best route for the landscape and the environment. This has meant a few things. The road takes a route that disrupts the minimum amount of possible of existing trees and hedgerows. This includes ensuring that where the road has to cross watercourses, attractive bridges are used that look less like engineering projects and more like the modest traditional bridges that you see across Hampshire. And over 500 trees alongside thousands of native plants will be planted along the route to ensure it appears as an avenue, giving it a sense of place and purpose. This all ensures that the road is an attractive place for those who travel along it. As a 30 mile an hour road, it forms a key connection for vehicles and buses, stopping rat runs through Horton Heath, ensuring a key strategic connection. But the road isn't just for vehicles. If anything, cyclists and pedestrians are as much at the forefront of the design. A continuous cycle track is provided, which at all times is separated from a carriageway by landscaping. For the vast majority of the route, this means significant landscaping to ensure cyclists and pedestrians not only feel more comfortable using the route, but find it a pleasant experience. This includes pedestrians and cyclists having, on two or three walk course crossings, their own more subtle bridges. And I'm sure many of you here tonight will be able to trace the origins of those size decisions back to the local development forums that we all attended, where we all decided to it was appropriate to put pedestrian cyclists at the heart of this development. Ecological benefits are inbuilt, not only through the continuous landscaping and use of native species, but by specific design decisions. This includes, for example, mammal tunnels through the bridges, and in winter, when water levels naturally rise a little, mammal ledges as an alternative. We appreciate that there's local interest in how the watercourses are managed, but there can be no doubt that this application has followed best practice. The two statutory experts advising the Council, the Environment Agency and Hampshire County Council Flood Team, both have no objections, despite a rigorous assessment process. Therefore, whilst my colleague Steve Millard, who is here tonight as a flood risk professional, will speak to you shortly in more detail, the key fact remains that neither the Environment Agency nor Hampshire County Council Flood Team raise any objections. I think for those of us who work regularly with both agencies, we would know that they both operate a precautionary principle. So if there was any doubt at all, they would simply make it known. So all that leads me to, to, to our request is that we welcome the support of the committee this evening so that this crucial piece of borough infrastructure can be brought forward without delay and mark an important step on the journey towards delivering one Horton Heath. Thank you. Thank you Good evening. Um, my name is Steve Millard. My company, PFA Consulting Limited, is the flood risk and drainage consultant for the Link Road application and also for the outline application for the One Horton Heath project. Um, I'm a director of the company and I currently head up our water management team. PFA has been involved with the One Horton Heath project since 2018. I walked the entire site at the outset so that I'm familiar with the area and the local conditions. Our role in the development team is to provide technical support and advice and prepare the necessary evidence to demonstrate that the development will be appropriately safe for its lifetime without increasing flood risk elsewhere and where possible would reduce flood risk overall. The drainage strategy for the Link Road follows on from the site-wide One Horton Heath strategy. The sustainable drainage strategy developed in consultation with the Environment Agency, the lead local flood authority and Natural England incorporates green suds designed to attenuate runoff from the development as well as providing suitable treatment to ensure the quality of the discharge to the local watercourses that ultimately connect into the sensitive river itching catchment. 
the proposed SUDS features have been designed in accordance with the national best practice guidance set out in the SUDS manual. The proposals include the removal of a culvert, renaturalisation of the watercourse channel and bridge crossings at the Quabbly stream to facilitate access to the Ellington Lane roundabout. The proposed crossings are clear span of the watercourse channel. Parts of the bridge embankments and supporting structures are located within the floodplain extents. Compensatory floodplain storage is therefore provided upstream to mitigate the small loss of existing floodplain. To assess the effect of those works, we obtained the Environment Agency's approved hydraulic model and agreed the methodology for new modelling work with the agency. We worked with a specialist flood modelling consultant to update the EA's model to take account of the latest climate change allowances and make minor modifications to include the new bridge structures and compensatory floodplain storage. The proposed bridge soffits are set 600 millimetres above the model flood level for the higher central climate change allowance for 2080, equivalent to a 56% increase in river flows. A sensitivity test run for the credible maximum scenario, which is equivalent to 127% climate change allowance, showed that the bridge soffits would still be clear of the flood level. The river modelling shows that the works would result in a minor reduction in flood levels immediately downstream. Additional betterment would then be provided by the reduction in post-development flows from the development parcels as a result of the attenuation provided by the said strategy. The proposals have been subject to thorough scrutiny by the Environment Agency and the LLFA. The EA has recently stated that we have reviewed the additional documents and considered that they satisfactorily address our earlier concerns. The LLFA is also satisfied and suitably worded planning conditions have been agreed to ensure that the proposals are satisfactorily implemented. Thank you. Uh, councillors will be aware of the, and I think it was mentioned in the statements from objectors about the um, claim that exists in relation to um, flooding last year. Um, I think it's important for councillors to note that, um, whilst I can't talk about it in detail because it's with our insurers, um, it's not accepted by EBC that any of its own works, Allington Lane, led to the extensive flooding or damage to any properties and the claims for property damage are being dealt with as an entirely separate matter and legal liability has been denied by EBC. Thank you, Helen. Dawn, would you like to come back on like, any other questions raised by the public? Uh, yes, I, I will do because there were four specific questions that were asked, I think, both by uh, Jan Coombs and in the Keir Wingrove written statements, which I think were the same. Um, so um, I have to say they're not directly relevant to the planning application necessarily because they're around uh, a separate matter in terms of a flooding incident uh, but nevertheless I will respond as far as relevant um, so the first one was uh, in summary what assurances have local residents got that there won't be at increased risk of flooding um, Hopefully the report does give all the assurances needed on that in, in some detail. So, um, but if, even if um, you're not confident of your own officer's report, I think the reality is that the, it is the, those statutory consultees who have you know, looked at this in, in detail and advised. So it's the Environment Agency and the local lead flood authority, Hampshire County Council, whose responses you can give significant weight to um, and their recommended conditions are all included. So um, you, ha you ha do have the assurances there that this, um, in terms of this planning application, um, then the, you know, the, the risk of flooding has been very thoroughly assessed. Um, the second question was around, um, again, around risk of flooding. Um, they've said caused by the new roundabout works, which you've just heard that the council is not accepting that that flooding was caused by those works. So um, that's all I can say really on that. It's not um, a matter for this application to consider. And again, consultees have considered in depth flood zone and flood risk for this application. 
Um, the third question is around what assurances are there that the new works will be maintained before they're handed over um, to the Hampshire's Highway Authority. Um, again, this comes down to conditions. Um, as is normal, then there are conditions for management, maintenance, um, delivery, obviously in accordance with the approved plans. So um, we are confident that the conditions are correctly worded and they can be enforced if necessary. And we do have proactive monitoring of our major sites, so it, it will be proactively monitored as well during the construction process. Um, obviously, Hampshire's Highway Authority will do their own checks and as has been said, we'll have a certificate of completion at the end, um, at the end of their processes. Um, then the fourth question was why, and this really isn't uh, relevant to this application, why, have, why haven't the previous works and Anton name been handed over after two years? Um, it, it's not a relevant consideration for this application, but I have to say that it's, it's not unusual for delays considerably longer than that um, for, uh, for, for completion certificates. Um, I had what, an adoption certificate come through today on another site that was um, eight years after the build, so it's, it's not a, an unusual situation to be in. But again, that's not really a relevant consideration for the planning matters for this application, just general information. So that's the four specific questions that were asked um, in terms of the representations on behalf of Mr and Mrs Butt of Moon River um, I th a lot of the representation was around the principle of the development um, not wishing to have development you know built in the area and that isn't what this application is about that, that has already been considered under the local plan process and indeed the outline application um, but well, I guess what is relevant is in terms of the comments around habitat um, and um, that is addressed in the report. There are There is biodiversity net gain, in fact, um, for, for the development and we've heard uh, the extent of tree planting and other habitat creation that would result from this development and climate change impacts are covered in the report. Um, I think that um, probably covers everything. I think there's a general comment that, you know, why do we have conditions? Why can't we have all the details up front now? That, that isn't the way the process works. We do always have conditions on planning permissions. They are for the fine details. Our consultees are very comfortable with that. Um, and there is a next stage in the process for condition discharge process, which follows on very quickly after the grant of planning permission. So, um, and the, the consultees will be involved um, in that process as well, where necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. So we're now at the stage where I like to open up the meeting to councillors for questions. Any questions, councillors? Nick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's below the implicit. Nobody has said that explicitly that the flood assessments have included the effect of the existing roadworks as well as the new roadworks. Uh, I'm sure that it, ha it, it has, but I just would like that complete assurance. Yes, yeah, um, obviously it takes into account the existing situation, whatever that might, that might be, yeah. Any other questions? Tim. I know it's not a direct consideration for this planning application, but the, the roundabout that, was, that hasn't yet been adopted after two years, it, have we tried to get it adopted? Is, is, is the delay with Hampshire County Council? I'm afraid that's not, again, it's not a planning matter. It's not something that I'm involved with in terms of discussions with Hampshire County Council in terms of where they've got to in their adoption process. We can find out for you, but it's not something that I can answer at the moment. Thank you. Any more questions, councillors? Steve. Thank you. 
Um, my, I actually took Mr. Butt's invitation about a year ago um, to have a look around the existing watercourses uh, from the Eastern Stream, which runs from pretty much the end of Fir Tree Lane through into the River Itchen. Um, and I can certainly see where his concerns come from. He showed me the remains of the various sluices and gates which were designed to hold back flood water and to release it in a measured um, and non-damaging, non-harmful way. Um, he also pointed out that Lake Farmhouse isn't called Lake Farmhouse by chance. It is a very low-lying area, and flooding on that bit of fir, uh, fir tree lane, Stroke Allington Lane, is always bad. Last July, it was frankly shocking, and as Jan Coombs mentioned, um, sorry, Mr. Mr. Butt's daughter mentioned, um, there were a couple of large vans which were flooded at the end of um, at the end of Fir Tree Lane. So I do worry that everything is in place to mitigate, and I appreciate that. We're not there to solve existing problems, merely not to make them worse. But I do feel that we should be taking the opportunity. So the first question then, I suppose, is, um, I think it's paragraph 50 on page 23, Hampshire County Council won't adopt the SUDs because they're not related solely to highways. Um, so they're saying that EC Borough Council should adopt them and be um, responsible for their upkeep. Uh, and secondly, Natural England in paragraph 54 also raised concerns about the SUDs. So can we be um, certain that the concerns of Natural England will be addressed and that EC Barry Council will take on responsibility for the SUDs ongoing and also will work be done to look at the existing SUDs? That large pond um, on the roundabout on Huntington Lane, which um, certainly wasn't doing its job last July. Um, if anything, it was making matters worse. It was pouring water down the road. So are we happy that everything is tickety-boo there and that everything will be OK? I then actually have some questions about traffic. So do you want that now, or do you want to answer the first question that I can ask the correct the traffic ones? Sorry, I'll answer the SUDS question first. There are, there, are, there are two separate matters. One relates to the application, one doesn't. So in terms of the SUDS within the application, the Sustainable Drainage Scheme, um, yes, Natural England and, and others have want to you know, be happy that there is a maintenance and management regime in, in place. And certainly, as planning officers, we want to see that too, um, as I'm sure the applicants do um, and there's no point in having plans and schemes if they're not properly managed and maintained in the future so yes we do have conditions on for the final detail that we've seen a lot of that detail already which is um, is very is very much good practice so um, it's just building on that and particularly in relation to sediments for this link road um, so yeah I can give you that assurance um, you then mentioned the existing suds at Allington Lane, so that's outside of the application site, so it's not something for the, the factor for this application. Um, and that really, I think that question needs to be sort of sent on to the Horton Heath team to respond to, um, which I can do. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, you have further questions, don't you, Steve? I certainly have, thank you. Um, traffic. Now, um, Dawn, you very kindly answered some questions I put to you by email last week, thank you. Um, the first question is actually Fir Tree Lane is going to be closed except for access. Is it going to be closed at both ends or only at one end? Um, you gave me figures for expected traffic flows. Um, along the various roads uh, as part of this. The thing I don't get is that the traffic with, by closing Fir Tree Lane will stop using that end of Burnett's Lane, which I'm happy to accept. But at the same time, we're told that it should reduce traffic in Fair Oak Centre. But I'm thinking that if I were driving from West End and going, 
I don't know where, well, the question is, where do the people who go up 13 at the moment go? Do we know that? Because I don't know where they go. We can't really plan for what traffic flows are going to look like if we don't know where the traffic at the moment is going to, if you see what I mean. So if the traffic that currently goes up Fir Tree Lane and then goes along Burnett's Lane <coughs> is avoiding Ferrock Centre, if you close Fir Tree Lane, the chances are they'll use Ferrock Centre. So my concern really, I guess, is the impact that this will have on the junction at Allington Lane stroke Ferrock Road, Sandy Lane, which is awful, we know that, um, at school going in and school coming out time, at going to work time, coming home time. So I know your figures you sent me um, have peak times. In actual fact, as far as I can see on that junction, probably about 12 hours a day are peak times. So I do worry that we haven't thoroughly assessed what the impact there might be. And then the, I suppose the final question on roads really is, Knowing that we already have problems in Allington Lane with the new roundabout, with um, um, what's well, so probably not allowed to call boy racers, but I will, using it um, to show how clever they are. <coughs> Looking at the plan for Chowcroft Way, if I were that way inclined, I would see that as a real challenge at about 12 o'clock at night to come down Allington Lane, round that roundabout, along Chowcroft Way, round the roundabout on Burness Lane, and then back again. Um, so, are there any sort of traffic calming things being put in place to try and prevent that happening? Because I just have a horrible feeling that in a few years' time, local councillors are going to have an awful lot of residents complaining about people using Shellcroft Way as a... Um, and yes, I know it's going to have lots of side roads and things like that, but uh, sort of midnight, two o'clock in the morning when these things happen, um, I'd be slightly doubtful how well those would work. Um, I've written lots of other things, but all relatively minor, so I won't uh, bore you with them, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah in, in terms of your questions, then obviously some of them relate to the wider Horton Heath development rather than specifically this application for a link road, but n nevertheless, I'll, 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 you know, I'll give the information that we have. Although it's obviously not necessarily in this report, it would have been in the outline application report, which was considered last year. Um, just to, yes, Firtree Lane. Yeah, sorry, it, it is. It's closed at the western end. Um, it, it is to remain open at the eastern end, with the road diverting into the development uh, via the local centre. Um, so that was on the outline uh, parameter uh, plans. Um, traffic in Burnett's Lane, yes, that's a, sort of a wider traffic issue that has, there are, there is data in the outline application for um, existing traffic and, and the results of the, of the, uh, the, the, the works and where traffic is likely to move. So it has all, all, all the junctions, all the routes have in the vicinity have been assessed by Hampshire's Highway Authority um, and particularly as, as you've mentioned uh, they've looked at where there's needed to be junction improvements and that includes the um, junction of Allington Lane um, with um, with Fer uh, Ferrock Road and Sandy Lane and that I think if you recall the outline application was um, you know a consideration that we advised that in Hampshire or the Highway Authority they will ultimately decide what the best design is and i think uh, um i advised last week to you that we that the you know we're close to getting the final design from hampshire and that can be made available um in respect of that outline um uh, application and uh, yeah there, there's been a, a fair amount of work done on that on that design to to make sure it to, it um, works as efficiently as possible um, yes, it's an interesting uh, problem, isn't it? If you know what what happens if uh, if a road becomes attractive to sort of the wrong the wrong users, if you like. Um, what I can say is that again, the road is designed to be a thirty mile an hour road. It, it, yeah. And Hampshire are have been very thorough on that because they don't want to have 
a road that enables traffic to go faster than that. They, they won't accept a design, if, even if you put a label on it saying 30 mile an hour, but actually traffic will travel it you know, 40 or, or, or more. So they've been, uh, and the design has been amended throughout the process, probably more pre-application, to make sure that it had all the key things that are needed to slow traffic down. So it's got, it's got bends in it, whereas it was originally it was quite straight. It's clearly got bridges which slow traffic. It's got um, things like land tree planting and, and, and visual cues and junctions. Which which slow traffic down. So um, yeah, we're you know as far as we can be. The design is you know it, we're confident that it will it is designed to keep traffic at that 30 mile an hour limit. And we were very keen that that it should be 30 and not 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 higher than that. And we had a lot of discussion early on with Hampshire County Council about you know convincing them that it it should be a 30 mile an hour road because it is going through a residential new, a new residential area. Um, so yeah, I can, you know, as far as I can say now, you know, it is designed for 30 mile an hour uh, speeds, which hopefully designs out some of the issues that you might be concerned about. Thank you. So Steve, more questions? Is that it? Something else, uh, it's probably not a question, it's an observation. Um, it's condition number 12, uh, construction hours. Um, it's just actually, there's a word that needs to be removed. Um, basically, construction review sticks are 800 to 1800 hours Monday to Friday, 800 to 1300 on Saturday, and at no other time on Sundays, bank closing and public holidays. So you just need to take that other out, because if you're being really sticky, you could describe that actually is giving permission to work between 0800 and 1300 on Sundays, bank holidays and public holidays. Um, I only put that in to prove I read everything. <laughs> right, councillors, any other questions? Michelle. Sorry, I just, for the interest of clarity, more than anything else, and just to be absolutely transparent on this, I'm just wanting to make absolutely certain, because you gave the lovely demonstration of the floodplain and that there are betterments in it. Is there anything in the modelling that would suggest that we are making the situation worse? Because we absolutely have listened to the bit about the flood risk, and I'm concerned that waterways that haven't been maintained in the past could create further problems. Um, and I know that it's a one in a hundred year event, but is there anything that is being done that it could potentially be worsening the situation? Um, so can you just go through the modelling again um, to be crystal clear about our position on that, or the council's position on that? Bear with me. Right, here we go. Sorry. Right. Um, we do have the drainage engineer here, Mr Millard, because um, the council doesn't employ its own drainage engineers, so we, I can't have a council engineer here <laughs> next to me. We use, uh, obviously, the Environment Agency and the Hampshire County Council as our, as our, our technical advisors. So, um, and I have to say that they... You know that's been the big question, and they have given us that assurance that there is nothing that will make the situation worse. Um, obviously, a matter of opinion and her professional opinion, and in, and, and uh, but that is their advice. Um, and that plan, that uh, extract from the hydrological modelling that I've put on the screen, is uh, is just one of the um, one of the extracts from their. Uh, the summary note from um, PFA, who have d done extensive work to sort of back up that that conclusion that there it there is um, there's a minor betterment, but it, there's no uh, there's no, there's nothing that will make the situation worse in terms of the modelling that's been done. So another question. Well, 
I would like to ask Mr. Millard, if I may, so that the red and the blue section, does that mean that they, because to me, when I see red, that means there's a high risk of flooding in that section. So although I understand the green section is a betterment, is there still a high risk and is that a result of anything that's being done? You, you at the moment? It on the, the left-hand side within the green, there's little red. Uh, the green. big section on the right. Oh, on the right, yeah. Yep. So in, in the centre, the grey the gray piece in the centre, which separates the, the orange from the green, that's the bridge. So the bridge is holding back some water and it's increasing the flood levels upstream of the bridge slightly and reducing the flood levels downstream of the bridge slightly. So yes, there is there is an increase in the flood levels upstream. Sorry, you got too late. Oh, sorry. <laughs> A small increase in the flood levels immediately upstream of the bridge and a small reduction in flood levels as a consequence immediately downstream. So if it's increasing the risk upstream, is that increasing the risk of flooding for any houses that are upstream? No, because the houses are on the downstream side. And if you look to the if you look to the extreme right of that that slide you'll see that we're back to blue again, which is no change. So that's the, the, the slide covers the extent of the effect of the works. So it's betterment downstream until we go back into blue, which is where there is no effect, and then increase upstream and we're back to the blue at, at that point. And has sufficient thought being given or installation of things like attenuation tanks or anything else that could reduce any flooding further or is that not an option in this area? Um, the, the scope of our work is to, is to devise a scheme which, will, uh, which deals with the, the link road. Well, we've also worked on the wider One Horton Heath development, but this work is limited to the link road. If I may, sorry, sorry, if I may just add, what you essentially are seeing is, is a natural attenuation. So the red, essentially, in a severe storm event, holds the water back. So by introducing the bridge, what you are actually doing is, increase, is actually adding an attenuation feature. So then as the water starts to recede as the storm ends, it will release it at a normal flow rate down the river. So the red bit you're seeing is purposely designed to hold that water back in a severe event so that it slows the rate of water going down the river which is why you get a small betterment downstream so that that is the natural attenuation feature and it may not be part of this process um, but I'm gonna ask the question anyhow because what we've seen in other areas is that those um, sluices and things haven't been maintained so is there part of the management plan the maintenance of this to ensure it continues to do its job absolutely so there's, there's two commitments isn't there i mean there's the council as a responsible developer will take its obligations seriously and we will we will do everything that we've been asked to do through the planning process but secondly you can you can also be assured that the the planning process places those requirements on, on anybody who controls that land at any point in time so those requirements continue into perpetuity. So what, what you don't see tonight is, is beyond this fairly strict planning process, there's a myriad of additional consenting processes that we as developers have to, council developers have to go through. So we, we have to apply for a number of further consents with the Environment Agency and with the Hampshire Flood um, consenting team that go right into much greater detail into the minutiae of those exact mechanisms. And all those requirements include management plans and regular maintenance plans. So you can rest assured both through the planning process and through future other consenting processes, the management maintenance of what's been designed to work can be held to account. And as, a, as I say, as a responsible developer, the council clearly is vested in making sure that what it says it will do, it will, it will do, and that those measures will, will work. So councillors, any more questions? I, I have some questions of my own, so uh, I've waited until other people had, uh, had asked their questions. So one of my questions is actually just based on what uh, Michelle was just saying um, about uh, the conditions 
so the water flood risks won't be any worse than what they are currently but um, how do we know what's worse and what's not worse so they'd be constantly measured um, and it's, so there's, there's two sides to this water issue it's not just the, the, the volume of water it's the quality of it so during construction there's going to be a lot of potential silt introduced into the water which could um, you know, damage water courses so it's about the monitoring of that as well you know, how are we monitoring it um, what is being done if, they, if the silt does increase uh, and, uh, and who's, who's in, enforcing it so that's my first question Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, a, lot, a lot of the constancy advice does, you know, do, does cover the question around management and maintenance, and, and in, including the construction period. Um, so yes, we there is, um, you know, there, there are comprehensive um, management and maintenance monitoring plans uh, already in place, um, and they're they're going through their final checks. Um, and they will include remedial options. So, you know, if uh, a, a single stage of the the sustainable uh, drainage chain, um, it, it f you know falls down for whatever reason, then that that they're being checked individually. So you know where the problem is. If the, if you do get a sediment issue, and then you can you can um, uh, you know remediate that. So that's. That's um, you know that's good practice. That you you, you, know, you look you're, you're checking not just the overall outcome of for sediments. In this case, it's the biggest is the big concern, but also checking each stage of that drainage so that you you know you, you know you know where where you know that each part part is working. <coughs> Thank you. So in terms of the water. Um, if there's an, an excess of water, a flood event, um, but how do we know whether that's, uh, that's worse than normal or, or not? Well, um, you, th this is where you, the, 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 the modelling comes into play and the, the information that you have. So um, all the quantities have ha are, are working off a, a, a baseline information um, so yes, that they would know if something was very different to what's been discussed and agreed and assessed. So, um, uh, the, the, I mean, it's it's you have to rely on the on the the, 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 the reports and information that have have done that work. So if it's something very different from that, then then you would you then have to look at. Um, uh, 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 the reasons why, but the, all the modelling has accounted for, as you've heard from the drainage engineer, from for you know climate change events and and uh, the precautionary approaches on top of that. So it would have to be something very exceptional to go beyond what has been um, modelled as as, as 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 a possible scenario. Cool. So. As I understand it, it's the uh, Natural England that's, uh, that's uh, responsible uh, for ensuring that the water quality is, is correct. And it's the County Council for the flood mitigation that, uh, to, to, that would be monitoring the um, flood mitigation. So uh, will there be frequent checks by natural, a natural representative from Natural England and Hampshire County Council during the construction process and afterwards so um natural england and and, and hampshire as a flood authority the the first um requirement is for the council as a planning authority and there are consents and as as you've heard there are other consents coming into play too but under the planning permission and conditions then the the first checks would be by um by the council as planning authority so um, and then, um, if necessary, we would then take the advice of the council team, whether it be Natural England in terms of water quality, or um, Hampshire County Council, or the Environment Agency in terms of water volume. So, um, but the initial, you know, the imi initial compliance um, enforcement, legal enforcement is through the council as planning authority. That's where 
the responsibility lies. Thank you. I've got a couple more questions. Um, so, Eastley Rambers have, have, have raised a, a, a query about the, the cycleway not being continuous. What was the response to that? Uh, the fact that it's not shared, it is shared by uh, pedestrians on one, one part of it. Um, I'm not sure if it was a concern. They, um, the Eastley Rambers were you know, raised no objection to the application. Um, I think it's a fact that, um, as I've explained, that the cycleway is, well, the cycleway, footway cycleway is shared. Um, that is not not at all unusual um it is i think the key is its width um and in parts it's four and a half meters wide which is wider than a lot of roads um so it's got enough width to accommodate the numbers of pedestrians and cyclists who safely without without issue so um yeah we've certainly considered the width of it and we did consider whether it needed to be fully separate but that that has certainly has pros and cons um and given the the, the likely number of users and it, you know and the width of it it wasn't considered necessary to have at, at this point in time to have a separate um pass and that was the advice of hampshire highways as so they considered that um Ultimately, in the future, it's wide enough if you wanted to separate it, if the council wanted to separate it in, in, you know, in discussion with Hampshire County Council in the future, it's possible, but it just wasn't considered necessary um, at, at, this, you know, at this stage. And I don't think Eastley Rambers were, were concerned about the, <coughs> the safety of users. It's just, it was just a different option that you, you, could, uh, you could have. Um, on, um, but it's not one that Hampshire Highways have said was necessary. Two more questions. Uh, so our penultimate question is about noise. So the, the, re report. the noise report um, uh, was quite uh, detailed, but I didn't see uh, about uh, afterwards when uh, the construction is <laughs> finished. Um, will we be monitoring the noise? to see whether it is uh, uh, still acceptable, um, to, because it, 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 the, the report was uh, went into quite some detail about noise in various rooms, expected noise in various rooms in, in the houses. Um, what's the situation there? And I'm asking this question because of the issue we have in West End with the motorway over the years, it's just got noisier. I know this won't be as busy as the, as the motorway, I hope not, <laughs> but, but it does concern me. Um, no, I don't, I don't think it's the intention to monitor noise um, after the development, um, the road um, has been built. Um, what it is important is, obviously, is the noise is a consideration of the, for the applications for residential uses in particular that adjoin the road so that, you know, they, uh, it's in under those reserve matters application that noise will be considered in more detail what what we've sought to do with this because it is just the road for this application is to ensure that um it, it as far as possible it you know re it's designed to reduce uh, so minimize noise impact um uh, uh, as is you know necessary given that it's a 30 mile an hour road so isn't um classified generally as a noisy type of road but we what we're asking for is just further details of any any landscaping or um surfacing of the road that may assist in reducing noise um for when we consider the detailed applications for the residential schemes that adjoin it so it's a sort of a two-pronged approach but the residential schemes themselves will ha then have to consider noise and any mitigation that's needed so you know acoustic uh, glazing or other sort of screening, acoustic fencing, things like that. So um, it's, uh, but we won't be monitoring noise from this this application um, after we've approved those construction details. So my last question is about the planning enforcement because uh, 
when you have a, a new development, you often um, get a lot of uh, <coughs> comments coming in from members of the public, and I just wondered uh, for this and the other uh, uh, constructions going on, uh, will there be a permanent planning officer uh, assigned to this project? <laughs> yes, I mean it's a, yeah for the whole of the the wider Horton Heath scheme that's including all its phases, including the road. Then um, we already do have a proactive um, enforcement, a member of the enforcement team who is specifically dealing with the Horton Heath site. So and that that that's intended to continue. Um, the Section 106 agreements provide quite extensive funding for that as well. So. Um, so the expectation is that that will run for at least the the you know the build period for the whole of the um of the whole of the Horton Heath development. Thank you, Dawn. Does that conclude questions from councillors? Right. We'll move on to debate now. So before we do, uh, I need a, a proposer. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's been quite long so far. Um, we might. I think it's probably good that we stop at this point for a comfort break for five minutes. So if we can come back at uh, quarter two, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, can we recommence the meeting, please? Right, so we've got to the part of the um, application where, uh, for councillors, uh, work for a debate. Uh, but before that, I would need a, a proposer and a seconder. So, uh, who can I have as a proposer? Janice, thank you very much. And a seconder? Nick. Uh, would you like to, to speak, Janice? Sorry, only very briefly to say that thank you very much to the officers for their excellent presentation. Thank you very much indeed for members of the public that have come along to give us their views. We have listened very carefully to everything that has been said. Um, but for myself, I have to say I am very content with what the officers have told us, including the background and the expert um, uh, the experts they've had on board giving their advice and uh, that advice has been certainly pro this link road um, so I will be voting in favour Nick, have you uh, got anything you would like to say? Well, it's quite apparent that I will be voting in favour for the very good reason that this is an essential element of the Horton Heath development that we have proved in principle before. It is a, an essential part of the building block. So it, it has to go ahead if it's the right road. And this development, therefore, is a, it, this, this question facing us today is, is this the right road in the circumstances? There are a lot of difficulties with the road, but these have been addressed one by one by the appropriate agencies. I'm tick the flooding is, is, is a big issue. We know that there was a problem, not just a problem, a huge problem, uh, a little over a year ago. And um, unfortunately, Mrs. Coombs, Mr. and Mrs. Butt, etc., uh, were very badly affected by that, and we all know about that. And it, it's a problem that is not something that we can address in, at, at this meeting. There is separate uh, a means to address it and it's in the past. Well, the question is, is this ever going to, is this likely to make this worse? And the sh clear answer that we've had from um, all the experts, uh, particularly our own consultants, but also the Environment Agency and the Hampshire County Council uh, Flood Agency, who they know, they know the background, they know the difficulty, they've gone over it with a tooth comb. They say it's the best. It, it's not going to make things worse. Now we can have huge storms again. 
Nobody's making any guarantees, but it's, this is not what's going to cause the flooding. And those are the questions that we need to, to address when deciding whether this road should go ahead. Those questions have been addressed. I think they've been addressed very well. The very comprehensive report says, explains how that was done. I think I'm very satisfied that that's been done properly, and therefore I will be supporting the recommendation. Thank you, Nick. Any other debate? Michelle. Um, I want to thank the officers too. I was on the development forum and I was a very firm believer that if you can't stop a development, try and make it better, which is what I've been really actively involved in. So I wanted to thank them for the cycle routes um, being separated. Um, even I'd like to see it even further separated, but um, that was good to see that um, in the presentation that that has come to fruition because we were very clear that we wanted to encourage cycling, we wanted to encourage walking, and we are trying to keep them separated. So thank you for that element, which was really good to see. Um, I know it's not part of this um, application, but I'd still like to make the statement that I, because I've listened to what you're saying, I do believe that um, EBC um, needs to um, undertake a review of the existing situation. We can't make things better, or we, and we're not making things worse, but I do believe that, and I'm going to ask my Hampshire County Councillor um, if he can help us with the review, because I believe Hampshire County Council are responsible for the culverts, and I'm worried about the maintenance and the management and the fact that they need to be cleaned out. So although we can't, I uh, know it's not part of this, I am asking that EBC take active steps to get some of those ditches and culverts cleaned out, um, and that the culvert gets widened in one particular pinch point um, or improved so I know this isn't about improvements but I think we have a duty to make sure that as we see the one in a hundred year floods becoming more frequent something is done to improve the situation um, so I'm hoping that working together um, between Eastleigh and Hampshire County Council something could be done um, thank you thank you Michelle a anyone else Steve Thank you. Just to answer Michelle's point, um, there's been a flood response group meeting for the past year, um, on and off, and certainly looking at culverts and waterways is something that Hampshire, the Environment Agency and Southern Water are all starting to work, I think, much better on. So hopefully we will we'll be seeing improvements there. Um, I'm still worried about this. What worries me, I mean, I'm slightly concerned that yet again we're devolving the sort of final decision to the head of, um, sorry, the executive head of planning and economy and the chair of this committee. So uh, we're waiting for the um, environmental impact assessments to be completed, um, but councillors, members, presumably won't be consulted on accepting those, and obviously members of the public um, won't be. Um, but a more concern for me is actually the traffic side of things. I'm still worried that this is potentially going to put more traffic into Allington Lane at the Fair Oak Road junction. Um, I can't see any way that it won't, to be, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I'm, I'm disappointed that we haven't any real facts and figures about where traffic flows go at the moment and what changing the road layout is going to, um, going to have. So on that basis, <sighs> I might not vote against, but I certainly can't vote for this um, this uh, uh, proposal. Tim. Um, yeah, so uh, I raised some of these issues when we talked about this before. Um, and Hampshire County Council's, frankly, antediluvian highways policies uh, shouldn't be accepted by us as a developer. We, we should be a lot more progressive than... Um, some of the things they'll accept. We talked about the 30 mile an hour speed limit through the development. Um, I, I think it should be 20 miles an hour. Uh, I, I'll just quote from Professor Gillian Annabelle, who uh, is from Leeds University and, and a specialist in uh, 
in roads and highways and, and, and particularly active travel. She says that the, the evidence says loud and clear that we can improve the alternatives to cars until the cows come home, but if we don't at the same time place some restrictions on using the car, i.e. making it more expensive, closing some roads, making car, car making parking so plentiful, then it won't make a lot of difference to the actual amount of car use. And so you can improve the alternatives. You can put in as many carrots out there as you like, but if you don't have the sticks at the same time, you won't get a lot of shifting from car to bus or cycling. Um, we've only got seven or eight years before we've blown the whole budget, uh, uh, carbon budget out to 2050. Um, about one in five cars journeys have to disappear from our roads. And so, I'm disappointed that as Eastley Borough putting this forward, um, we're not being more radical in, in trying to reduce those, those cars. Uh, I, I still feel it's like a development that's, that has too many cars for my liking. Um, and uh, I respect uh, uh, Councillor Marsh uh, getting very involved in the, the working group and, and thrashing out these details. And, and I regret that I, I haven't been able to do that. So I feel it's a bit churlish of me to come down here and, and vote against it. But for those reasons I've stated, I'll have to abstain. Any further debate? Well, I have a few things to say. Um, you know, this this uh, whole project uh, has grown much larger than I uh, thought that it would when it started all those years ago, um, with the Burns Lake Residents Association uh, and their. Um, complaints about the, uh, the heavy goods vehicles and how this initially started off as a way to, to offset the heavy traffic in Burnett's Lane. Uh, 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 and it, it, it grew very large. But when you look at it, uh, I think it's been done very well because the, the Hall Road uh, to, uh, from Bub Lane through to Charcroft, uh, I said that I, I would find it difficult to support unless that was put in first. Uh, because of, of, you know, we really need to get the traffic, the heavy traffic off of Burnett's Lane, which has been a, a problem ever since I first became a councillor back in 2006. And um, so it was put in, and then from that uh, we've had other things. And so that, that now we're, we're, we're deciding on a, on a road, uh, short road, possibly a mile long, but it, it's, it's being funded by the council beforehand. And normally, uh, these things are, are funded from developers' contributions once the, the houses go in. I remember asking about the secondary school that was planned, um, and they, they said, well, before they could even start to fund the secondary school, they'd need about 100 houses built. Uh, you know, all this infrastructure is going in first, and I think the council should be uh, lauded for doing so. Um, the, I feel, you know, as a, as, as a councillor, this is, you know, we, we need to scrutinise these things. Uh, especially something as big as this, and when you, if you just say Link Road, it doesn't sound very big, but when you look at, uh, at not just the report that was printed, but online, when you look at all the documentation that goes with it, there's a hell of a lot of documentation. You see the amount of experts that have been involved, and, and you realise that um, but many of the, you know, we've had a lot of questions here this evening, but there's so many more questions we could have had, but those experts have really covered basis and the fact that this was delayed because of natural, natural England weren't happy, but now they are. Uh, so I have a lot of confidence in, in this road. Uh, I think um, that, uh, that the fact that we, I can't speak for other local authorities, but I, I can't see this happening in too many other places uh, around the country where we get uh, such infrastructure in first. Um, and one of my passions as people that know me is off-road cycling. You know, I've been trying to get more cycleways uh, in, in, in Eastleigh, especially West End, uh, linking uh, Southampton, uh, Southampton up with uh, Hedge End and with, with, with Horton Heath. I mean, I still have a, 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 an issue trying to get to, to Horton Heath from here safely by bike. Uh, I'd like to, like to see better, better links there, but the fact on this road um, that we've got an off-road cycle route all the way from one end to the other, it's, it's just uh, incredible. So I should be supporting uh, this, this project. 
And I think in, in, in response to some, um, some comments that have been made this evening about heavy traffic, I just hope that, and in fact I'm seeing it, there are more and more people cycling. And uh, I think in more and more, and, 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 the, and this development has been uh, developed or planned in such a way that it actually is encouraging, it's not discouraging uh, uh, car use, because you, you can't really do that, but it, it is encouraging um, more people to, to ride bikes and scooters and, and such like. So I'm, I'm hoping that the, the, the demand uh, on uh, motorised vehicles will, will change. So that's, uh, that's what I have to say. Um, so we're at the voting stage, I guess. No one else wants to say anything else? So can I have a show of hands, please? All those in favour? Against abstentions. Thank you, councillors. Right. So now we move on to rights of way diversions. Uh, can I ask David uh, Pickett to present the report, please? Yes, uh, thank you, councillors. Um, as you've seen from the presentation, <coughs> Uh, there are three rights of way affected by this proposed road. Um, the first location that it's uh, affected, so the right of way number 11, where um, the creation of a, a, a drainage pond means moving the Sorry, right of way. Could you just turn your microphone off for a second? We're having a technical issue. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, all good. So, shall I go back to something? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, the creation of the drainage pond will mean moving the right of way a very small distance to the northeast, no, correct that, northwest uh, of the pond. Um, the terrain is pretty much the same as you currently cross. It's just a slight diversion around the edge of the pond. So uh, the consultations um, or discussions, I should say, with uh, the Rights of Way People Ramblers Association have uh, not uh, thrown up any objections to uh, moving that path to one side. Uh, the other two locations uh, are where rights of way cross the, uh, the road and in both cases the, uh, the relocation, which is a matter of metres, um, moves the crossing point to a central um, part of short straight sections and makes sure that the right of way crosses uh, at 90 degrees, uh, the shortest distance across the road, rather than going diagonally as it would if it followed the existing route. Um, so there, there are logical um, rerouting of the crossing point. But uh, in, in moving those onto crossing points, it ensures that the right of way remains intact and available to use. So the uh, report is uh, seeking to um, get agreement for uh, proper consultation and advertising of the proposed changes for, uh, for these rights away. Thank you, David. Do we, do we have any speakers? No. So I'll now open it to councillors for questions. This is possibly not actually relevant to this particular application, but it's just an interesting question. Are these rights of way going to remain open during the building work? It seems yes. <laughs> I'll take it as a yes. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? No. 
So we need to, uh, to vote on this. Uh, normal situation, proposers as a seconder. Can I have a proposer, please? Michelle, seconder. Nick. Is there any debate? All those in favour? Against? Abstentions? I think that's, uh, that's passed. Thank you, councillors. This concludes the meeting. I would just like this opportunity to thank you for listening and thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>